This is a one-hour discussion about DevOps. We've got our DevOps experts here who are going to be answering questions for myself as well as anyone in the audience, so this will be wide open. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce everyone, and then we'll get started with questions. So um, as I introduce you, just please raise your hand or stand up, whatever you prefer, just so people know who you are. Uh, the panelists are here, and I specified their names as well as the companies that they currently work for. So Douglas Watkins is a product and business development executive in networking and mobile technologies. Currently, he's a chief product officer of STN Essentials. He previously was the EVP of strategy and business development for Funware and CTO of Edgewater Networks. He's also worked in corporate development inside of Cisco. Glenn Gerard is a regional country manager at Benelux and Nordics at Puppet Labs. So Puppet Labs helps customers automate their infrastructure, which provides a foundation for DevOps. Jacoby Thwaites is a Google alumnus who founded Sparkle in 2012 to develop the market. Uh, develop and market the Sparkle sequencing engine, which is the key missing piece that ties logic to SDN automation. Rohit Agarwala was one of the first OpenStack contributors from Cisco and is currently active in a wide range of product development, customer, and community efforts around OpenStack. Sergio Hidalgo is CEO of Intelliment Security, where he develops a product and business strategy for the security policy orchestration controller. He has more than 30 published network security papers. Stace Hipperson. Okay. <laughs> hey, Stace. <laughs> I was looking for you. CEO and founder of Real Status, whose application allows the visualization and management of traditional and hybrid clouds. And finally, Stefan. Talami is the technical leader in Cisco service provider video group focused on cloud services. So folks, we're going to go ahead and just get started with the questions here. I'm going to lead off by asking, and this is open to anyone here on stage and uh, Jacoby as well. What is DevOps? How do we define DevOps? What is it? Anybody? Any takers? So how do I define DevOps? I define it as the culture, your methods, and your tools to develop and deploy software. Anyone else? Joe, could you pass that to him? Looks like. Yeah, a lot of people in the, in the DevOps uh, community to also to kind of talk about the CAMS, C-A-M-S, so culture, automation, metrics, measurement, um, and sharing, and so those kind of different aspects. A lot of, there's a lot of kind of uh, focus often on the, on the automation side, but you say the c cultural side of it is also an important part of it. Actually, some of the tools and things that you, you use kind of help reinforce the culture of DevOps as well. Um, I, I guess I want to add as uh, DevOps uh, is like helping developers deploy their code easily and helping operators understand the code that the developers want to deploy. I think so you need the tools and the process uh, and you need to close that gap between developers and operators to enable that. All right, great. So following up on that, what's the future for DevOps? Where is it headed? Thanks. Um, it used to be that DevOps was really only, you really only heard about it in, in large web shops like, like Google. But what we've seen at Puppet is that traditional enterprises are, are really taking over, really wrapping their arms around DevOps because they're seeing real business value out of it. So I think the future for, for DevOps at, you know, at, a, at a very base level is that as more value comes out to, uh, to customers, um, businesses that are embracing DevOps now are going to see much more competitive uh, benefit uh, in the future uh, as they compete in the marketplace. We did a survey in 2014, the state of DevOps, and what we found is that uh, customers that were were uh, moving forward with, with DevOps, um, with DevOps, what they're seeing is they're able to deploy code 30 times more often with half as many failures, and 
you know, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a soft thing, but th those same companies reported the highest job satisfaction in, in their IT organizations. And that job satisfaction was the key indicator of, of a successful, higher profitability, um, mar better market share goal. Uh, they're meeting their market share goals and they're, and they're meeting their productivity goals. So again, from my point of view, those who are embracing it now are gonna be much better positioned in the future. Yeah, and I've seen similar impacts in, in product development, you know, outside of just an IT organization, but actually developing products that IT would, uh, would use. But you gotta go through that, that cultural change in order to, to get them um, and the tools that are associated with it. Question, Nathan, or comment? Did everyone hear that? So to repeat the question, going? what do you need to do to get engineers to embrace DevOps? That's right. And it's worked. Yeah, it worked for <laughs> <to> me. <laughs> <laughs> if it works, sorry, go ahead. Okay. So let me parse the question just a little bit further. What type of engineers? So so software engineers and network engineers because they're different. Ah, so you're going to have a follow-on or a repeat <laughs> question uh, that's, uh, that's in there. So my, my personal experience doing this with, with software engineers is the, you know, existing guys that had been writing embedded code for, you know, 15, 20 years, largely in a switch and routing uh, uh, type of an appliance, didn't really want to make the transition. What I ended up doing was forming a separate silo in order to take the silos out. So I brought in a much smaller team to experiment and to gain the data to understand um, what it was going to take from a tool perspective uh, to build out um, what worked and what didn't work and to take those learnings into the larger or organization and then converge that back together. That initial resistance to change of, well, what do you mean we're going to go to test-driven development and we're going to, in essence, remove a good portion of the QA function. Um, that used to exist when you're used to kind of developing things, throwing it over the wall to QA, right, and it moves on, on down the path. Those things are, are you know, culturally harder to uh, take out of an organization and, and to change over. So that's, you know, my experience there was to basically just show them, okay, this, this is what it takes, this is how it works. Um, to your point, the, the, there is an increased job satisfaction that's associated with that as you see your features come out and hit basically reality faster. Um, and the larger organization follows. Working with network engineers right now, I find there's a segment of them that really want to learn how to code. They kind of see industry-wide where it's moving, and then you've got a sub-segment again who just doesn't really want anything to do with it. Um, they may know how to script right now, but I think it, it scares them more than anything else to, to even dive in to try to figure out um, how to code. So I think you need to show basically a path um, for them forward in either case. Does anyone, answer. Steven? I mean, another route to, to that is just basically wake up the engineer, the software engineer in the middle of the night when something goes wrong. And then they'll have an incentive to do something about uh, the, you know, the automation and, the, and these kind of things. But I mean, it's actually a kind of a serious kind of topic. Even if you're not going to go to that extreme, which, you know, you, you may find that a number of software engineers will go, well, I didn't sign the, uh, you know, 24-7 uh, uh, kind of support organization. If you kind of take that in, in steps, at least getting the software engineers who wrote the code involved in triaging of a live issue or a, a deployment issue or something like that. So they're actually involved in that process. They understand, well, actually, if I had just put in a bit of, you know, better logging in this phase, or I'd actually thought about how this thing is going to be, you know, uh, monitored or check that it's uptime or, you know, understanding, well, actually, this, this particular piece of software had these dependencies. If only it could kind of report out its status of those dependencies and how it's, how it's using them. Oh, well, I can't actually contact the database. If you were to put that through to, you know, some sort of a, a status API or something like that, it would make it easier. So it's kind of like getting the software engineers themselves involved in the, in the triaging of, of live issues. It's sort of a step towards that, that kind of thing. So um, I agree with that point of uh, responsibility. Um, many software engineers, and I'm, I'm a software engineer and probably guilty of this, develop software and then don't feel responsible for what happens in production. So the key thing to do is, is engender that feeling of responsibility so that when something goes wrong in production, the software engineer does actually get the call 
um, uh, on a pager or the mobile to, to sort it out. But the difficulty then is that you've got to teach these engineers what their code is actually running on. And if they're very algorithmically minded, it may not be that they're very interested in the underneath the infrastructure and the servers. So there is an education piece that needs to be done. And you'll find that some people really like that, and some people don't. And you have to work out where to slot people into this new top to bottom organization uh, that you call DevOps. And I'm not sure everybody can, can encompass the whole thing. You will get people who are very algorithmic, and they're good at working out how to make something work you know, one tenth of a second quicker. And you'll get other people who just love making things work. Um, and you do have to deal with these different types. So being an OpenStack guy, I want to segue this into using cloud. As an application developer, all you care about is making sure that the application runs on the infrastructure. And cloud and things like OpenStack, which is an open source cloud operating system, provides you uh, that capability to mimic a physical environment on which you are going to be deploying your application into a virtual environment. So you can create virtual compute, you can create virtual networks, and you can actually see your application run. And, and as a developer, that's the feedback you want when the application actually goes into a production environment, right? So that's the part that I would expect for a developer to jump into being a DevOps. So you can use like Amazon Cloud to deploy your application. You can use Rackspace or Cisco Cloud Services to deploy your application. I think that, that uh, when we talk about uh, if uh, a software developer needs to learn about operations or if a network engineer needs to learn about programming, we are focusing on uh, too much on how to automate software provisioning. But there are a lot of uh, applications that can be built on the same concepts of uh, DevOps. We are always thinking that uh, yeah, the same task that is today done by a, so a software engineer needs to be automated when we are talking about provisioning that software by a systems engineer. In the same way, we are also thinking that a network engineer needs to, or a system engineer needs to learn, to learn about how to automate by programming the tasks that he usually does to automate the uh, provision life cycle of, of the software. But uh, in uh, uh, projects of uh, other scales, I don't believe that uh, uh, learning a skill set, uh, a new skill set by any of the two profiles of worker is not, is not going to, 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 to be, re is not realistic. I think that uh, in, in bigger projects, it's easier to uh, integrate the both profiles on the same project and provide value to the project itself. So it, it is, I believe that uh, it is not needed for a network engineer to learn programming or for a software engineer to learn how to operate systems, but to provide value to understand the, all the other needs and to provide value to the project in order to build uh, an application. So what are some, oh, go ahead. Uh, as a follow-up to that, what should network engineers do then to start, get started with DevOps and programming and start to embrace it for those who do want to embrace it? So what should network engineers to get started with DevOps in terms of embracing it? I think we sort of talked about that, but we can say about how they would start. What would be a start for them? Yeah, so as the only one who didn't start as a software developer up here, and I'm totally on your side. So what, what I would say is for, for a network engineer to start, the first thing to do, because you know it's been mentioned before, DevOps is just as much about culture as it is about anything else. To start, find the least scary software developer and go to lunch with them <laughs> or take them for an adult beverage because that's going to be your first step. I mean, to the point you made earlier, it's important that there's some kind of crossover. You don't need to learn his job, he doesn't need to learn yours, but you do need to, to have some understanding. I feel that you know, with the shift to, to DevOps, and it is a pretty, uh, a pretty major shift, we're definitely seeing that, that network engineers are in a better space than anybody else because they have the, uh, the latent skills to handle big technology shifts, while the rest of everyone else thinks that packets flow by magic. 
but we work mm -hmm. really hard to make sure that it seems simple to you and <laughs> you, don't, uh, you don't have to worry about it, right? So network engineers, think about it over the, of the space of the last 20 years, how many major changes has there been in networking, right? Now, you don't remember ThinNet, but I do. And I remember token rate. I still see job, applica uh, job uh, specs for, uh, for software developers that know Fortran, but I never see any for token rate. Network engineers always have to be out in front. You just don't think about it that way. You think, okay, well, uh, we need to, uh, we need to uh, get whatever new product is installed, get the network uh, running faster, whatever the case may be. You already have the skills to make the shift, but you need to, to pick up some additional skills, obviously, but it's absolutely possible. I think the shift is actually gonna be easier for, for some of the networking folks than it is gonna be for the, the software folks. Now, the rest of them are mad at me that I said that, but they're sitting there quietly because they know I'm right. <laughs> I'd like to uh, defend myself. Um, I was accused of being a software engineer there, but actually I started as a networking engineer, but this was back in the days of token ring and Novell Netware and IPX and you remember this stuff? Okay. Um, but the point, the point that's made is, is really good actually, that you, you do need to introduce, I think in software people, a level of understanding of what's going on down there. The, the software people, we, we do have a tendency to imagine the network is perfect. So infinite bandwidth, infinite reliability, uh, infinite everything provided by these wonderful network infrastructure engineers and the moment it goes wrong, we shout at them. And it's really, really unfair. Um, but getting that level of understanding, I think it's two-way. I, I don't think it's just that the network people need to work out what's happening further up the stack. I think the application people have to get an understanding of what's happening down the stack. And, and that chasm between the two, that difference between network, de network infrastructure and application development, that chasm has got to be crossed sometime. And if you were to ask me what that, that looks like, that chasm, it's the blueprint. So if you show me a network blueprint, and you say, that's my network, and I'm unable to infer from that what the applications are that run on it, what's the point of that? That is the chasm. And it represents this sort of thermocline between your application people and your networking people. But it's definitely two-way. There's no way we can just say one group is responsible for learning. So I think a couple of points regarding, uh, regarding network engineers. One, the job's fundamentally changing, right? I, I mean, we, we can see that. We can see that by everything that's happening around us. The advent of, of SDN changes that, right? It takes a lot of what a network engineer does today in configuration, and it puts it into software. And that software needs to be able to run in a data center. That's where these controllers run for the most part. And once you make that move, now you're talking about how do you operate that in this true kind of software deployment environment that we call you know, DevOps largely across there. So the, the first thing, you know, in my opinion, is to learn, I think every network engineer I've ever met actually knows how to code. And this comes back to what you were, you were saying earlier. The base skill set uh, is there. And then, you know, you may just be writing scripts or whatever today. But you can take that and you can move it and say, okay, can I move that to, to write Python? Can I learn Java? Right? You know, Cisco's doing an awful lot um, in this area with different boot camps and things really coming out of DevNet to try to help you um, get that skill set to be able to move on. Putting an environment together to allow you to experiment on the technology, right, so it takes away some of those, those fear factors of just learning, you know, what software is, how it's developed, um, that kind of fear of you know making a, a mistake, so putting you into that structured environment. Um, the guys that I'm seeing, you know, make the make the transition. Most of their questions are about what do terms mean. They're, they're not sure, you know, what things that application developers use every day. What that means because they don't use them every day. And as they pick that knowledge up, they very quickly adapt. I think so. I, I want to give a very specific example of what a network engineer could potentially do. So software engineers use, you know, tools like Git or Jared for version control. Uh, as a network engineer, you're probably maintaining a bunch of network devices that have configurations on them. You want to try and combine the use of versioning tools with your network configuration. So as a network engineer, you start to now track changes as the network configuration on your devices changes. Right, so, so you know exactly what changed from one 
uh, network configuration to the other. Uh, the second example is use of CI/CD. So, you know, application developers uh, change code all the time. You want to test that in a QA environment as soon as a code change comes in. And once you pass certain tests, then you want to push that into a production environment. So from a network engineer and an ops guy perspective, I think so these are kind of automated things that you want to make sure that you're tracking uh, as changes come into your environment. So what the heck is CI CD? You just I said CI CD. What is that? I can answer that if I'm anybody. Uh, okay, so continuous integration and continuous deployment, right? That's that's what it means. Um, so continuous integration is that you make changes to your code and it, it, it basically gets deployed automatically and you're running a bunch of tests against the change that has been done. And these tests validate whether the change is not breaking your network or is, is complying with the policies that you have set for that application. So you want to automate that in your environment so that manually you don't have to test every time an application change happens in your environment. Anybody else want to take just to, to kind of add to that, I think um, uh, also as part of the continuous deployment process is also continuous delivery as well. So uh, a number of organizations aren't quite ready to have an environment where you know a developer is, is checking in some code or checking in some config changes and, and, and then some system takes over and it's deployed and it's, it's out there and, and it's all ready. A, a number of organizations still need a few kind of you know, checks and balances, but the, the, the kind of idea of continuous delivery is that you're always delivering packages, be those deployment packages or, or, uh, or software packages, to uh, something that then can pull from that delivery system at the time that they're ready to roll that out. And, and actually, you find that that often is the case. I mean, uh, some of the stuff in the, in the WebEx team. So the WebEx uh, team in, in Cisco, uh, they really uh, want to roll out their changes during office hours because they want to be around when stuff is being pushed out in case something goes wrong. They don't want some system in the middle of the night to be kind of pushing out a new thing, so they're controlling it. So this kind of, there's, as well as the kind of, you know, just pushing the button and making it go all the way out, which might seem like a scary full um, system, and you need a lot of those kind of tests and checks and balances and things in place, you can kind of break that up into a kind of delivery model and then have things pulling off it as well. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> okay, I, I've been waiting for a while. So guys, a lot of talk about DevOps. I'm in marketing, so I'm a bullet point kind of girl, okay? Give me the top three advantages or benefits of DevOps. And I remember token ring, by the way. <laughs> Speed to market. Number one predictor uh, of uh, of success is happy organizations, and happy organizations uh, 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 take uh, use DevOps. So back to the culture yeah. part, right? Right back to the culture. Yeah, uh, to, to hammer again on this 2014 uh, state of DevOps uh, um, uh, survey that we, we did, you should take a look at it. That's got more bullet points than I can remember. Yeah, feature velocity, culture, and then I would add that there's actually a reduced cost component to it as well from a, from a development uh, cycle perspective. Um, you, you reduce, if you've been doing regression testing and some of those things in a more manual environment, by automating that and, and bringing it in, you can reduce the overall cost that's associated with it. And I guess, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really about de-risking stuff. It's all about removing the risk. And, and the more that you can automate, the more you can make things repeatable, the more you can, you know, uh, make it, the, it's very easy for a developer to, to test right the way from the end-to-end -end onto an open stack or onto one of these environments. It's just de-risking the whole process, and it means that things can move much faster. So it's all about de-risking. So I guess the three bullet points would be agile, making it automated, and closing the gap between the developers and the operators. There's, there's another one. Agility is important. Optimization is important. But there's a new one which is conduct risk um, for banking and other regulated sectors which are complicated. Uh, they're finding that the impact of conduct risk is very high monetarily. Uh, they get fines. And in the case of one bank, for example, we're talking 
uh, $20 billion of fines in two years. I won't say which bank it is. So conduct risk, um, as represented by a failure to do their business properly, is one effect of not doing your systems development properly, in my view. Um, and I think if you, if you take those three, agility, optimization, conduct risk, you've got your bullet points for, for this methodology. Thanks, gentlemen. Is that the three that everyone agrees on when you said you take those three? The top three? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, from the application developer point of view, since there is no standardization for the rest, for an open source application developer, what are the real ch challenges with multiple controllers in the market today? Would you repeat your question, what are the real changes? Is that what you're asking? For an application developer, open source application developer, there are multiple controllers in the market today, right? And HP or maybe Cisco or there are multiple controllers as such. And there is no standardization at the rest as such, isn't it? So what are the real challenges for the deployment, CI, CD perspective, what you talked about? So just to rephrase, what's the standardization given there are many vendors and different approaches? Correct, yeah. correct. So I'm going to give a perspective from OpenStack, and which is an open source project. Um, and what that provides you is a level of REST APIs so as an application owner, and I have my friend Reinhard sitting at the back, he can probably talk more about some of the applications, but as an application owner, what you want to do is rewrite those using those REST APIs. So you're agnostic to the controller or the backend implementation that you're using. So services within OpenStack such as Neutron, which is the networking service, uh, can basically interface with several different vendor devices, whether it be Open Daylight or it be an APIC DC or Juniper switches, uh, you can basically program through the REST API and it will make sure all of the devices that require to be configured are done appropriately. But as such, uh, for that to happen, for the deployment perspective, it won't be seamless deployment, will it be? Because there is no standardization. Well, the API, well, the API is, 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 is is going to be constant that your application is going to be using, right? Underneath, you can change your configuration the way you want, but the application is still going to just consume that REST API that it is exposed to. And yeah. I guess the gentleman Sorry. wants to add something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I can answer this. I'm Stace Hipson. I should be setting up here. So my <laughs> application actually does do that. We hook into OpenStack, Open Daylight, HP Van, uh, amongst others. Forget about standardization. It's not going to happen. You're just going to have to deal with what we have. What we have is a lot better than what we did have three years ago, right? So Open Daylight, to me, looks to be the winner in the, in the uh, SDN controller space. Um, open Stack, but you're going to have to deal with VMware as well. So I guess you just have to deal with the multiples and be thankful that we actually have an API into this stuff. That would be my takeaway. You have. Yes, exactly. Be grateful for the API you have because <laughs> we didn't always have it, it's only new. <laughs> so what are the common tools or just tools in general that are being used for DevOps now and do we have ones in the future that are on the horizon? Uh, so, so one of the ones that we're using a lot is Vagrant. Um, so Vagrant, we're, we, we love that tool. Uh, it, it's fantastic for provisioning um, uh, VMs in, in, in any environment that you want. So you can, uh, you can provision it just uh, on a local virtual box running on your laptop. You can then, with the same commands, you know, uh, Vagrant up, bringing up a VM, you can do the same command and it will launch something in, in OpenStack, you know, cloud services or, or AWS or, or vSphere or any of these kind of technologies. And we, you know, when you use that in, in combination with you know, uh, an installation, uh, something that can do your installation like Puppet or Chef or one of these, or Ansible, one of these tools, again, you get a really powerful environment uh, that makes it really easy for a developer to get a lot of benefit. I mean, one of the, the I mean, we were talking about how do you get a software engineer more kind of interested in these kind of things. If the fact that you can just press a button and up comes an environment and it's just like the live environment, 
and it's for you and ready to go. And it's got all the software installed in the same versions. I mean, getting, often getting that onto your development laptop is, is, a, is a real pain. So by using things like Vagrant and these other tools, you can instantly get a development environment that's ready to go, ready to build on top of, reflective of, of you know, the real environment that you're actually going to be deploying on. And what was the name of that tool? Again? Vagrant. Vagrant. I think it starts up front, right, with what you're using for a code repository, right? So it gets a popular one um, that's out there right now. And if you start to go from there to your integration tools, whether it's a Jenkins or something like that that's sitting there to your test things, it could be a Cucumber or whatever, right? There's a host of these that fit into each one of these, right? You've got container stuff, and then you get into your uh, different deployment and automation, and then, you know, monitoring on the other side of it. Um, and there's probably a combo of 60 or 70 different tools in those kind of basic areas that I, that I outlined there. But I think it spans that whole scope. Yeah, and I don't think it should come as a surprise that you should automate this all with Puppet. That would be my <laughs> position on it. Um, but, but, you know, to the earlier point about what, what do you use, there are so many tools you, you really do have to, to pick your favorites. Puppet should be your favorite on the automation <laughs> side. <laughs> but uh, but for you know across the board you really have to pick the one that you're you're going to go with and, and go from there. I, I think you just mentioned Jenkins, Git. Obviously, we use Vagrant as well. Clearly, we use Puppet. So you also need to remember about monitoring, so you can be a little more responsive and and uh, and um, react uh, responsive and proactive instead of just reacting uh, to things. And you need a way to orchestrate all that as well. If at the end of the day you write some code and, and as you so rightly say, it goes out to an environment and the tests are run and you've got an, inclination, uh, an indication of the test coverage and you know which exact tests have failed, hopefully none, um, and you can divide your tests into unit tests and component tests and system tests and, and it all deploys and works in a uh, parallel environment, a pre-deployment environment, then you've done it right and it almost doesn't matter what your tools are. Um, and clearly there are a lot of tools, but our favorite is Puppet. Let me make that perfectly clear. <laughs> and, I, and when I said at the beginning about the, the CAMS acronym, the sharing part is really important, and we found that very important. And getting involved in communities around DevOps and kind of saying, well, what worked for you in this environment? And we've got that, you know, within Cisco, but in, in, in sort of the wider community, the DevOps days and so on. When you get involved in this, you go and talk to people, well, I was doing this kind of thing, and how did that work out? And, and just sharing the experience of using these tools, because every, everybody's environment is somewhat different, right? And so certain tools are going to be much better. But if you can really share and can go and talk to people uh, about it, that's a, it's, it's a key part. That's why they put the, the S in, in CAMS. It's just because the sharing part really helps you deal with that, that aspect of this sort of multitude of tools that are out there. I think so. One other tool I want to highlight would be Jared. It's a review system. So, you know, when you're contributing code across different set of people sharing code, uh, so when you start pushing code, you want to make sure that it gets reviewed by other folks and you accept things that you want them to be part of that code when others use it. So I, I, it becomes a very useful to, tool in the entire DevOps environment then. Okay, so I would sum, so we, were, we talked about Puppet, Vagrant, Jared, and then there was uh, one, one other one. Jenkins. 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 Jenkins, okay. So we have our list. Uh, no, we're not complete yet. No, no, no. Oh, well, let's, um, let's ask if there's any... Jackie B was mentioning you actually need to know whether you build the pathing or not. So you need something like Sonar Cube. Uh, you need to know what your code quality is. So you need static analysis tools and reporting. That's partly your code Sonar Cube, partly Jenkins. You need somewhere for your artifacts. I mean, at the end of the day, you're producing something that's probably part of a pipeline. So you have to have artifact management, something like Artifactory, for example. Uh, you need to get some kind of deployment mechanism onto your cloud platform. Uh, the monitoring of the overall deployment, you did mention monitoring. There's so many pieces to this puzzle and so many potential solutions in any one of them that it's really hard to get your head around all of it. But we do have a DevOps pod back there. We can talk about it in detail and start seeing how some of these play together. It's quite interesting talking about the way different languages handle this um, process of being sure the program is doing what it should. Um, I do a lot of programming in Erlang now, which is a functional language, but it's dynamically typed. I used to do a lot in Java, which is uh, an imperative language, but uh, statically typed. 
Um, I hate Java now. I, I cannot stand type systems. They drive me mad. But they are a way of ensuring that your code modules are doing what you expect. Um, in the dynamically typed world, I've discovered in Erlang a wonderful thing called Dialyzer. I don't know if anybody's come across this. But, but broadly speaking, it does a, an analysis of your function signatures to determine whether they uh, will collaborate correctly in respect to type, where type is a thing like a list or a, a string or an atom or whatever. So different languages have got different tools. Um, but so long as you use the tools, uh, that's the important thing. And what was the name of that tool again? Uh, in Erlang, there's a tool called Dialyzer, D-I-A-L-Y-S-E-R. Uh, that maturity concept in fitness to purpose is really important. So at Java, I can appreciate your points about Java as a language, but it is very mature. There's a lot of tooling around it, a lot of support around it, a lot of frameworks, and it works well for certain purposes. Uh, you get other languages, Python's very popular, for example, and we're trying to import a lot of lessons into the Python world that we discovered in the Java world. And you keep getting this continual recycling of ideas, but also a recreation uh, of best practice from one domain to another. And Python's not as mature as Java is yet, but it has its advantages. And again, there'll be something else in the future that will replace that, but have its advantages. The key part about all of this is that remember what the best practices are, and to keep those domain independent. So everything you are trying to do with making sure that Java works properly, with the unit testing, and the system testing, and the analysis, et cetera, it applies to many other languages too. And being able to decouple the best practice of what you're trying to achieve from the implementation of your system is really important and to focus on those best practices. So speaking of that, since we're at a Cisco Live event, are there any Cisco tools that are on the horizon or platforms that are also support DevOps. <laughs> Here's me, my microphone, I'm not on the panel, but yeah. One of the, the key tenets in the automated testing is being able to test your system in a clone of the environment into which you're gonna deploy it. Now, that's mostly an IT server environment. That's a relatively straightforward thing to do. However, if you're gonna be writing network-centric software, actually testing the software in a clone of the system you're going to deploy it into, it, it's, for most intents and purposes, it's just not possible. You can't have multiple networks sitting around for testing. So what we've created in Cisco is something called the Virtual Internet Routing Laboratory, which allows us to create and run virtual network infrastructure, which provides the basis for the clone of the production environment within which you can do your testing before you actually deploy to the network. That's a very important piece of technology. And if you like the missing link between how we bridge from CICD in the application development world to CICD in the networking world. It's worth saying we've got uh, a demo of viral. This is how we developed uh, the Sparkle use case, which we're demoing out there. So if you want to see viral in action um, as a means of emulating uh, a topology and then building against it. It's a fantastic tool for developers and really does speed, speed it up. Previously, what I used to have to do was get three ISR G2s in a rack in a data center up the road, um, and that cost me a lot of money, um, but now I can just emulate it and develop against the emulated environment. So it's, it's a really strong tool. So if you're, if you're considering OpenStack, or even cloud for that matter, um, then we have several integrations with Cisco devices. Um, and, and these, so when, when you're provisioning uh, VLANs, for instance, you can have a Nexus driver that makes sure against the REST API calls, the VLANs get provisioned onto the Nexus switches. Uh, so there are several integrations that are happening from, from an OpenStack perspective and networking perspective that as a DevOps person, uh, you can rely on the REST APIs to do that for you. So let's shift gears a little bit. We, we haven't talked about security at all. In fact, usually those two, DevOps and security, are not using the same sentence. So can DevOps be utilized for automating security and network systems? Can it be utilized for operation systems for automating security? Any thoughts on that? I think that uh, in order to automate security, in a DevOps process, you first need uh, the APIs which are needed to uh, the APIs which are needed to uh, interact from uh, to with the with the network devices from the security perspective. Today, uh, 
most vendors are not providing an easy way to uh, interact uh, to the devices. Most of the uh, APIs provide constructs to for working with uh, networking primitives like interfaces, like uh, IP addresses, but from other uh, other things more related with applications of that uh, networking primitive, say for example, how to configure an IDS rule, how to configure an, AC, an ACL, how to analyze an ACL. Uh, we are facing a lack of that uh, kind of functionality from the, from the APIs, or <coughs> they are lacking behind other uh, more uh, widely used, uh, used con constructs. So I think that uh, APIs need to be completed in order to provide access to the whole network device functionality. Because with, uh, without that, it is uh, quite difficult to complete the, the CICD cycle and to provide all the uh, configuration that is needed in all the networking devices, including, of course, security. So I think, I mean, uh, the, the automation piece as well is, is great for security as well, because if you've got, you know, a whole set of hardening scripts for your, your environment, then, you know, they get checked in to Git, everyone can, uh, or, you know, whatever your source control, it gets checked in, everyone gets access to them, you, you can roll those out. And also the, uh, the security folks can, can see the whole configuration of your platform, so everything that's being built on top of it, it's all there and go. There's no, no more sort of kind of guessing how a virtual machine or a, a system has been set up. You don't need to guess because it's all there. You can go and inspect and go and look at the way it's being configured and look at the best practice that are being, because it's all there laid out in code, it's checked in. And as long as you're making sure that you know, that is the only way things can get onto your system is through an automated, you know, uh, workflow, then you know you've got that guarantee and then it's very, very easy to roll out new security and so on. Yeah, just to add on to that a bit, something that we're big on at Puppet is configuration drift. So when I was a, a system administrator, we had this guy, I'm, I'm going to call him Pete to protect, the, uh, to protect the guilty. Pete used to go to machines manually and do bad things to them because Pete was a bit dim and would open big holes for us. We'd have to go and, and work out where is this, this, uh, this issue come from. We'd have to work it all the way back and it always came back to Pete. But anyway, with, 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 uh, with, a, with an automation tool like Puppet, what we do is <laughs> we'll look at it every 30 minutes and, and to your point, right, we know what something's supposed to look like. So if Pete's changed the root password, or if, uh, uh, if Pete hasn't properly applied or rolled back a patch on a, on a Nexus switch, we'll put it back every 30 minutes. And we can also then see, well, when did this change take place? We've got all the logs. And from a security point of view, having the, that audit trail is very important. So, you know, security is multi-level, but a lot of the times, most of the trouble is from within. Somebody does something, you know, just for a second, I'm going to open up this, uh, this port. Just for a second, I'm going to make this change. And it ends up that, that configuration completely drifts, and you end up not knowing where your problem comes from. So you really need to have an automated way to ensure that, yes, this, these machines, these VMs, these switches are set up exactly how they're meant to be set up. And I can prove that to an auditor when he, when he comes in to, to check. The um, danger of automation is how quickly these holes can be taken advantage of. Um, there's a company I know uh, works in the same building as us, um, accidentally opened a hole in uh, Amazon and immediately incurred 3,000 pounds worth of Amazon EC2 instances being spun up uh, for heaven knows what purpose by somebody outside um, before an automated email from Amazon arrived. So that's how quick and easy it is once you've got a hole. Um, with automation, it can be taken advantage of very quickly. So it, it does, I think, introduce some new threat vectors, right? And I think there's the advantages that, that we're talking about. But certainly as you expose APIs that are going to be controlling a network, that's a new threat vector to come in that has to be dealt with. The plus that comes out of all of this, though, is the fact that, as you're saying, the audit trail is there, that data is there. And by taking the data that you extract out, 
it becomes to me almost like detecting credit card fraud. At the end of the day, right, they can take the, the massive amount of data that's coming across. They've got algorithms running that can detect that anomaly. And the same rich amount of data comes out of these systems can detect what's going on much earlier than it could in the past. Um, and to the other points, you can shut things down much quicker as well. Go ahead, Nathan. You mentioned new threat vectors there. Um, and new attack vectors. It occurs to me that each one of the systems we mentioned as part of the very complex integrated tool chain that we use for CICD in and of itself also represents an attack vector. Getting into Jenkins and changing what your job is doing or changing what your monitoring is doing or changing what your reporting is doing or corrupting your artifacts, each one of those is also an attack vector. And the more that we build complex systems, the more we're introducing complex uncertainties into the system itself. So what are your thoughts about hardening the CICD chain against these threat vectors? Yeah, I think this comes back to segmentation, right, as far as security goes, and I think that needs to be, you know, segmented out to, to your point. You know, and you, you've got to, uh, you've got to control access to that. I think it's quite a deep question there, which is about the provisioning of stuff, which is general purpose for the needs of a specific application. So if you consider a database, which is very general purpose, uh, let's say SQL Server, then consider the application you've written, which is what it's there for. The, the thing which is really annoying is that you've got this attackable SQL Server with ports that exist on a network. And it would be rather lovely if it didn't even exist until the moment it was needed by the specific application you're talking about. Um, so when it comes to hardening, I think we need to abstract better uh, and join up this chasm that I referred to earlier between infrastructure and applications. Um, and that's a subject I'm always happy to talk about. So let's talk about use cases. We've, been, we've talked about the advantages of DevOps, but we haven't specifically said where we think it is truly needed, whatever our top use cases are. Does every company need DevOps? What are the top use cases of why I would apply DevOps? All right. Every company is a software company, right? Let's say every software company and or hard... Yeah, every software network company, software network company, in this case. Yeah, and, and again, what we're seeing with DevOps is a, a tighter integration between uh, these teams that have typically been siloed. When you get that tighter integration between them... Th th <clears throat> so your use case is what? Well, how would you label your use case then? So I guess it, it depends on what layer you want to talk about use case. We want to get right down, down to it. You've got uh, better security through automation because we're going to have to agree to disagree on that. I, I think mm -hmm. automation is good, obviously. Um, but um, you've got an audit trail, so you can see who ha has done, done what. But on DevOps itself, look, we worked with a customer a, a while back that took 60 days. They had invested tons of money in, in virtualization and other data center technologies. It took them 60 days still to get an application provision because they hadn't implemented the practice of DevOps and getting these teams working together. Now, once they started, once they got through the cultural shift, right, that, that we spoke about earlier, once they got through that, they're able to do it in minutes, not days, and have a, 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 a platform to develop on very quickly with uh, a system that looked like production that they, that they were able to work with. So, so that's just that velocity of getting out there is something. Protecting your, your switches, protecting your... your th so there's many good reasons to do this and you know, you know from specific use cases I, I, I could probably sit here all, all day and rattle on about it but there's there's quite a few I would say application velocity security audit trails and and breaking up the silos so that the devs dev and ops are working together towards common business goals for the companies because after all that that's what they're there for and I, I work in the in the video um, part of Cisco, and so we actually, I mean, 
uh, we both deal with client devices and server devices. So obviously, you know, you talk about DevOps, a lot of things in the cloud and kind of web services and these kind of things, they naturally, you, ha you see that discussion around DevOps very naturally. But even in our client software area where we're deploying to set.boxes, we're deploying software out of set.boxes, again, the same principles and best practices are coming into play in terms of the automation, the continuous delivery. It might be that that delivery is to a, is, is to a remote device, but again, those management, the logging, the monitoring of those devices, the report back from a set-top of what it's doing and how it's doing and what's going on in it, all of those things that we're starting to see very applicable as well as, as you know, these connected devices, they become more powerful. But it also, you know, it's, we want to be able to push out our software reliably and rapidly. We don't, I mean, set-top boxes shouldn't go wrong. If, if, you, if you're in the middle of watching TV, it should not go wrong. So, you know, it's even more vital that we can, we can control these devices, but we can do it in a repeatable and controllable fashion. So even, you know, away from the traditional kind of cloud view that a lot of people, you know, looking at DevOps, we're actually seeing it applying to sort of client devices as well. I've got the definite use case for DevOps that you just inspired me. Mission critical, match it today. It must not go wrong. Absolutely, yeah. Never, never let the TV... Well, what, one of the other ones is you never, never, never make my daughter cry because her TV, favorite TV show has, has finished. It's, it's just, you know, it's cut off and it's gone blue screen. You should never, that should never happen. Um, so, yeah. It, and, and it's that's critical systems. TV is really critical in a lot of people's lives. All right, that looks like uh, we need to wrap it up. Oh, I had one good, one more question. Okay, I can ask it. All right, everyone in the room and probably in this entire building is wondering, is DevOps gonna cost network engineers their jobs? No. <laughs> Not DevOps. Not DevOps. No, but unless network engineers become network programmers, SDN and NFV could. All right, we have a discussion on that tomorrow, so that'll be interesting. Yeah, so t to my earlier point about the networking engineers kind of being ahead of the curve, I, I don't think so. I, I think guys like Pete should always be worried about their job, um, but uh, they, network engineers already have the latent skills. They, they're already ahead of the curve. It's an ever-changing uh, uh, industry, right? So people that, that, don't, uh, that don't keep up will fall behind or, like me, end up in sales. One of those two things will happen to you. But there'll always be a need for, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future for network engineers that understand how to get a solid, rock-solid, reliable network up and running. The three characteristics of infrastructure, I always think, are that they are manageable, reliable, and scalable. And network engineers have that understanding. Most application developers don't. So <laughs> network people must feel safe about this. You change what you do, but you keep those basic qualities there, and you're way ahead of a lot of software developers. That's, that's my view. Every time one of these trends comes along, like Agile and, and uh, sort of automated testing, it's like, oh, our, our QC engineers or QA engineers out of a job. It's the same thing with, with, with network engineers or operation. Are they out of a job because we're going to automate everything? Well, no. It's, it's that, as you say, it's that mindset and it's not that understanding. Of, you know, the QA engineers now get involved in automated testing and they're, they, they're thinking about how do I break the system? How do I, what are the, exactly the same with operational engineers, exactly the same with network engineers. They, they, they won't be out of a job. They have those latent skills that, the, you know, the application developers don't have? Well, I bet, uh, yes, some, uh, <laughs> some <laughs> engineers are going to lose the job, but not, uh, a network, but not the network engineers, but the network operators. So with DevOps, m most of the systems and the working tasks are automated from the operating perspective. So I see that uh, most network operators are going to be relegated to testing if the software that has been made to automate their job is doing things well. So I think that they need to be converted to be part of the development process of a product or a tool that is uh, threatening his work, his job. So it is a, a quite uh, a compromise position for network operators. All right, final I, comment. Yeah, I, I'll just Thank probably you. quickly wrap this here. Uh, if you as a service provider or in, as an enterprise have a cloud use case, I think so it, it's useful for a network engineer to adopt DevOps. Uh, I think so it's critical. It will make their lives much easier. 
I want everyone to thank everyone for coming, and I want to thank our participants uh, for answering all of our questions regarding DevOps. Thank you very much.